We're back, everybody, with Dr. Jason, and we're going to go again into mental health. We're going to be talking about what you could be doing now. Give us kind of like a frontline report, almost, if you will, on maybe your last week and some of the things you're hearing. David, really, thanks for having me, and, and really, thanks for doing this. Happy Mother, Mother's Day to the mothers that are tuning in. Yeah. Um, so what's going on now on the front line, you know, we're, we're really things have changed and for the, for the betterment, I think, for, for society. We're still walking through specific doors. They're asking us specific questions about whether or not you've had a, a fever, um, you know, soft, this, this shortness of breath um, or anything, sort of symptoms that might correlate with any sort of illness. What I like about it, though, is that they've also added another piece. They've also added, are you having balance difficulty? Are you having... Things like uh, double vision, hearing losses, uh, taste taste differences, because those indicate, and we've now known, we now know that sometimes those are now the first symptoms of this this sort of situation. That I think that there is something called a viral encephalitis, which is an, which is an infection of you know of the brain, and those things can kind of go together as this virus also takes over the bloodstream. So you may not have a fever at all. A prior and we think that that happens initially and uh, by the time you get a fever you're days into this situation so now they're asking those questions as part of the initial quest questionnaire people are still wearing masks of course outside and also in a lot of grocery stores and but in the hospital you know it's really mandatory at least around here to wear uh, you know a mask everywhere you go but the numbers are dropping considerably and we think that a couple of things are going on. One, we know that the virus, at least for the studies we have in hand, is that the virus cannot live or doesn't typically live at a temperature above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing. It also dies when it's exposed to sunlight. So those two factors uh, work are working now in the favor of just the general, general public to keep the numbers low and to also extinguish um, what, what we're up against. With regards to patients in the hospital, the numbers again are dropping. We're not seeing the volumes that we've seen earlier, just in just the last several weeks. So mm -hmm. it's dropped considerably, and and you know I think there's some light at at the end of the tunnel. I know some states have made you know certain checklists on what you know kind of criteria they can have to open certain things and reopen. Uh, what are your, do you have any other thoughts on that? The local governments are being very, very, uh, you know, they're considering each, each, each of their societies is very fragile. They want to make sure that people are going to listen. Mm -hmm. People are going to, should, this shouldn't be a, a time period where we're just going to wash our hands for now and then you go back to the way, the way things are. It should always be that people wash their hands and just practice good sanitary measures. Mm -hmm. So social distancing, I think social distancing is gonna probably continue. It may not be as dramatic as it's been, but as long as people are not, or are conscientious, that germs are real and they can be deadly and you need to wash your hands and really protect yourself. I think more things are gonna open. I think one of the biggest challenges are going to be large crowds, things like, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, if it's NFL football game or NCAA football game, uh, basketball games, et cetera, whether it's also concerts, those are going to be the real, the real challenges because in those, in those close areas, certain things happen. Uh, fans, uh, fans are having a good time. And sometimes you can, you can forget that, hey, I really still need to practice sanitary measures. So right. those are, yeah, I think, real challenges. But I think overall, if we change as a nation and be a cleaner society, then I think it's going to, it's going to go back to the norm that, that, that we wanted to go to. Yeah, that's, that's good information. Uh, thanks for sharing that. How has your week kind of changed from this month to last month? Has, has there been any, uh, you know, significant changes for you? Yeah, so as, you know, as a neurosurgeon, we have been only uh, performing urgent and emergent procedures. I think that's across the board with all, with all physicians. Mm -hmm. We're starting to creep up into a zone where we can now uh, start doing elective cases, which means that people that have waited and it wasn't necessarily a life and death situation that needed surgery, we can now start to perform those operations. So that was a significant hit to a number of, of, of uh, physicians in the, with, with, within the medical community. In fact, just this last week, I was able to have face-to-face -face conferences with family members. 
back okay. to operating on, on their loved ones. Now that's only happened at one hospital here. The other hospitals are hopefully going to follow suit in the next couple of weeks, but it's a very, very dicey and challenging scenario. But for one hospital, I can, I can definitely say I can, I've had some conversations um, just as recent as Tuesday and Wednesday post-operatively from, you know, loved ones. Now they don't let them stay in a hospital with them. Mm -hmm. They haven't gotten to that point. So I think they're easing the lines as, as the numbers get better. And I think we're going to see that across the board in different, in different states and cities. As you mentioned there, there's a second wave, but there's going to be a lot of different types of waves. I'd like to start with your recommendations first and what mentally people can do to stay sharp, to not go down a dark path. Um, because that also, when you're down that dark path and you're feeling a certain way, that could make you more susceptible to any type of virus. So um, your thoughts on how, what people can do now uh, to, to remain strong and healthy uh, mentally. Absolutely. That's, that's really a great topic. And I think that's a topic that we really haven't focused on all that much, just global from a global standpoint. Right. Things that people can do. I tell you, you know, if you're idle and you're not doing things, that's really a workshop for depression, suicide, you know, anxiety, et cetera. It's also a workshop for, you know, domestic violence and all those things. One of the second waves is, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, it's not just the virus coming back or a different strain. It's what, how people are going to deal with this mentally, how they're going to react to it and, and try to go forward. I think programs like this and programs that you've been doing just with motivational speaking and all those things, people need to tune into those things and understand that there is, there is help out there and there are people that are on missions to reach out to for, for several different reasons, whether you're just trying to be you know, a better person, uh, whether you're trying to just improve your life, whether you're trying to excel in uh, sports and athletics, and if you're, you're having issues with ideas of suicide or depression or, or anxiety. I think that if you, are, if you keep yourself in a state of mind where you provide yourself with appropriate nutrition, you're also exercising, you feel good about yourself, then you're less likely inclined to go down that dark road. And all of us, no one's, no one's immune to it. Anyone can go down that road. But have also some assets, have some credit in the bank with other people that mm -hmm. you can reach out to, and they can help you. Talk about it. Reach out to people. It's likely that you're not the only one that's going through it. And you almost become like this sacred support group, and you can support each other as you get through this. There's a lot of people out there that are suffering. There are a lot of people that really don't talk about it, and those people are more likely inclined to go down that road and can't, and can't turn around. But the more you talk about it, you actually become healthy and you're less likely to go down and continue down that path. Yeah, I think that's a great point because um, so many people don't realize how many people are in their corner. Anybody who's watching who feels that way, um, you're cared about, you're loved, there's people in your corner. And when you reach out to people, um, yes, it's going to take a little courage to maybe divulge certain information or how you're feeling because you know, that's not always an easy topic. And you doing that is not because you are weak. It's because you want to remain strong. There's so many people that you've been meeting to reach out to. And I did this with uh, close family members of mine that I haven't spoken to in years. And we said, you know, let's not let this much time go by again. Uh, because there's just life happens so fast and it's a great time to reconnect with people whether you're going through something or not what you said was was uh, very important for people to hear and this second wave is going to be just as I said in the beginning multiple different ways so the better you take care of yourself uh, the better prepared you're going to be and Jason, if you don't mind, what are um, some of the things uh, you're kind of doing in your routine now uh, to keep yourself sharp? So from my standpoint, first of all, you know, I, I guess I'm cheating because I have two little dogs. So that mm -hmm. helps. It's, I guess it serves as some company. I think that, you know, having pets is certainly a great thing. If you don't have pets, stay active. I do engage in workouts at my house and, and it's really to make myself not only feel better, but keep in tune with 
just being positive and having positive energy and going right. forward. All those things help. Could you talk about some of the supplements you might take um, that are good for brain health? Sure. So, um, you know, I have my, my diet. I try to at least um, in part uh, one month at a time. I, I actually um, practice a plant-based diet. I think those are, are pretty good. Sometimes it's a little challenging for people to engage in that. But they're different in terms of supplements. Triple lecithin is a very good uh, supplement that people can uh, get over the counter. It helps to, it's been shown to clean out the ventricles of your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, Balcopa minaria is another one. But something that's also very accessible to people is something called fish oils. And mm -hmm. fish oils have been shown to not only provide nutritional health to the brain, but also to the liver, the lungs, the heart. It's a really good supplement. Now, when you look at fish oils out there, they're not all created equal. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a specific ratio, two components that people need to look for. Otherwise, right. if you don't see this particular ratio in these components, it's, a, it's not a very good refined fish oil. And one is DHA and EPA. And those two components, the, D8, the DHA to EPA ratio needs to be uh, two to one. So in other words, if, if there's 1,000 um, uh, uh, units of the EPA, there should be double that in terms of the DHA. And they put that right on the, on the bottle, on the, on the front. And I've seen many fish oils out there where that ratio is actually reversed. And mm -hmm. we've sh we know in studies that brain health, uh, in particular, the NIH and Harvard and, and Johns Hopkins did several extensive studies. Julian Bales, uh, who people might know from the movie Concussion, uh, these studies date 10 to 15 years back where they have proven that fish oils and those components, the DHA to EPA, uh, the two to one ratio has shown that it's all it's neuroprotective and also you can actually recover certain areas in the brain that might not be as cognitively functional as they've been in the past. Yeah. Um, thanks for getting so specific with that. I just took notes on it. If you're just on a maintenance um, regimen, then you should look for ratios of something like 1400 to 700. Mm -hmm. If you are going through something where uh, you might have uh, you, you're in a recovery stage, you might need 2,000 to 1,000, that sort of ratio, just in terms of the DHA to EPA. I think those are, uh, and there are also elevated things for professional athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. you, and and those, those can climb up to uh, 2,500 to 3,000. And, you know, you want to also make sure you, before you go to those elevated levels, to, to you know, just, just confer with your, with your physician to make sure it's okay. Just right. to make sure you're not taking other things that might also create, uh, you know, blood blood uh, uh, ab abnormalities. So I think that I think that would be a good thing. Triple lecithin is something that you can pick up uh, at GNC or another local nutrition store, and also um, Balcova Maneri. That's also been shown in several studies to help with just cognitive uh, you know, improvement, you just overall function, and you can take those as you know as a daily supplement. Are there any other kind of practices you do to uh, kind of help with your, your, your state? Uh, I know some people, uh, for me, working out is a good one. I make sure I go on walks for alone time. I know for some people, they do uh, you know, yoga or meditation. I think remaining engaged. You know, I also still read. I also engage in different uh, things like this, you know, talks that are on uh, whatever stream, uh, when people are, are expressing what they're going through, it makes me feel more human. No one's immune to it. Yeah. And I think more of that engagement, more of that motivation helps you to go, you know, the, to the next level and get, get, get through your day. I'm not the only one that's suffering through this. And there are other people out there. This is a global crisis. Right. It's not just here in America, it's international and it's going to happen again at, at some point. And I think if we challenge ourselves to endorse this task and you practice now and you engage in these things and you tune into to streams like this and some of your other, your other motivational um, talks, I think that, you know, you're going to prepare your brain like you prepare your body to engage in any sort of battle. So if you prepare now, then you're going to be ready and you're going to be set to, to engage just about anything. So that, those are things that I, that I do. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, now I want to do a little shift now. Uh, you do a lot of different work with the brain. Uh, one of the things I remember when we first met, we were talking about uh, the cue collar. So 
uh, we're going to do some more episodes and get really deep into brain health recovery and some of the latest uh, tech and studies on that. But uh, if you want to do a quick intro uh, on the Q collar, I think that would be helpful for some people also. Sure. So the Q collar is basically a device that was created by a company called Q30 Innovations, or rather, it, it they they in, they endorsed the collar and basically took the collar to the next level, just in terms of uh, studies with football players, uh, softball players, et cetera, and also the the uh, hockey ho the hockey league. And what the collar does is, when they set out to create this collar, they look specifically at animals that live primarily by striking their heads. So they looked at the woodpecker and the battle ram. What those two animals have in, in common with us, first off, the woodpecker, we know that the tongue of the woodpecker wraps around its brain twice before it exits the mouth. We know that the battle ram also has something called an omohyoid ligament, as does the woodpecker. We also have that as humans. So what happens is prior to, the, their, prior to them striking their heads, they actually tighten up their omohyoid ligament just before striking their head. And what that does is it mildly uh, restricts, not obstructs, but mildly restricts a small amount of blood flow from the brain. What happens is you have an excess of eight or six to eight mil, mil, mils of blood in your head. And so what happens is you prevent the slosh effect or the shaking of the brain within the skull. So basically, you're creating an airbag inside of the skull. That is, there's nothing else out there like it. it there's over 25, um, 2,500 football, 25,000, excuse me, football games in high school football that's, that this has been tested on. So, softball, uh, women's softball has been tested on it as well. And they actually delve deep and in look into MRIs with something called diffuse tensor imaging, flow cytometry. And these are... These are studies that are beyond what the normal uh, scanning or screening processes are for brain injury, and they definitively were able to demonstrate a decrease in axonal tears, things that you really don't see, but concussions essentially in almost 90%. So I think we really have something at least going, is, that's going the right direction uh, for things like that. And certainly Julian Bales uh, was one of the one of the um, uh, primary leaders in, just in terms of, of, of conducting those uh, studies. The, um, you know, Tom Hoey and, and the people at Q30 Innovations have really created a situation where I think we're going in the right direction. Yeah, and um, it, I remember when we first talking about it, it uh, brought up a personal name for me, as you mentioned, uh, I think Luke Keekley was, was trying it, and uh, I've known him since you know, he was, the teenager because he, he and my brother played on uh, BC together. So um, what, what was kind of the testing shown? And uh, if you want to go into a little bit on how he used it and how it worked and what kind of results you could kind of gather from that. Sure. So Luke w was wearing the collar really for the last couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the information that I have is that it helped him considerably. He's just been a you know, certainly an all-star on, you know, on the, on the, on the uh, football field. And, you know, we were used to seeing Luke uh, come back on the sidelines and, you know, uh, he sustained many, several concussions. I think the collar, you know, helped him a great deal. Uh, you know, it would have to, you know, it, uh, render his opinion as well. But from the, for the, for our standpoint, for the viewers, he was in the football game much longer than he was uh, when he wasn't wearing the collar. So hopefully it was that. I don't know if he was engaged in other things, but I think the collar overall certainly helped him. And, you know, again, you know, credit goes out to David Smith, one of the creators, and Julian Bales and the company for, for, for creating that. Uh, there's so many different angles we can take that and provide value for people and what's happening now and what's being in, you know, mixed up and cooked up for the future. So thanks for sharing that. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of uh, what we want to talk about today. Is there any, uh, some, so many great things were shared, uh, some very specific and overall, you know, things we could do for your health. Is there anything that, uh, that um, you want to add or maybe we missed, do you want to go a little deeper on or any final last thoughts for uh, this, this interview we're doing today? 
I would just, I would encourage people to just tune in, share their thoughts, uh, share the streams, uh, let other people know that these things are out there. Mm -hmm. I think it's so positive and it's, 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 an, it's a process that they can engage in. It's not going to cost them anything, but gosh, I tell you, it's going to help so much. And just in terms of their mental health and their overall well-being. And so I don't, I just think that if you have something else to do that you think this is going to help you help your body and help your mind. And long-term, you're going to take some things from these conversations. You're going to understand that you're not the only one going through this. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get through this together. Um, there's not going to be a vaccine for quite some time. But I think the point is the, the, the coronavirus taught us some things. We need to engage and reach out to the ones that we love. We need to recognize what's important. Mm -hmm. We need to be a cleaner society. And we need to reach out and help each other. And your mental health is going to be challenged in many different ways. So if you prepare now and you reach out and you engage other people, as a society, then we're going to be successful. Yeah. And I know it's a little cliche, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sayings and quotes about things coming into your life as adversities, but that, you know, creates a lot of resilience and a lot of strength. And, a, and now even a blueprint on how to use this uh, for something that comes in again in the future. Um, so, Dr. Jason, thanks so much for being on. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you more about brain health. And um, yeah, I think this, this was a great episode and a lot of value provided for a lot of good people. So uh, thanks so much. And we will be in touch real soon. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me.